Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. For those of you that I have not met, my name is Joanne Drake, and I currently serve as the Chief Administrative Officer for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. It has been my privilege to be with the Reagans for almost 30 years now, so it's wonderful to have all of you here. In honor of our men and women in uniform who serve this country around the world, we have a tradition here at the Reagan Library to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'd ask you to stand and join me now. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. I would like to first welcome our special guests this evening. First is the wife of our speaker and an author in her own right, Calista Gingrich. Also, for the second time today, we are honored to have our former Congressman Elton Gallagher and his wife Janice join us. Some of you may know it has been a very busy day here at the Reagan Library. Late this morning, we put on a panel discussion and hosted literally hundreds of guests from Eastern European countries, and we commemorated the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Although the official date isn't for another few weeks, does anybody know what it is? Very good. It is still hard to believe that it's been 25 years since the wall fell and President Reagan was able to see his dream of democracy and freedom come true for the people behind the Iron Curtain. This evening, though, we are here to hear from another one of our good friends, Newt Gingrich. He really needs no introduction. He truly needs no introduction. We're extremely lucky to have him here on a regular basis. And in fact, just yesterday, one of our staff asked me if we should just issue him a desk in his own parking spot. <laughs> I suppose it won't shock you to hear that Speaker Gingrich has been out stumping around the country. And as usual, he's had a few things to say about how our current leaders are handling things and has even offered a few suggestions as to how they might handle things differently. Everything from Ebola to the importance of the recent visit by the Prime Minister of India and to how the GOP could gain control of the Senate in November and even add to the majority in the House. We know Newt Gingrich as the former Speaker of the House a crossfire host, a presidential candidate, and of course, an author. At last count, he had published 24 books, both fiction and nonfiction. And just to jog your memory a little, Newt Gingrich was first elected to Congress in 1978, where he served the 6th District of Georgia for 20 years. He is well known as the architect of the contract with America, which led the Republican Party to victory in 1994 by capturing the majority in the U.S. House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. He was elected speaker in 1995 and served in that role until 1999. It is said that he, quote, disrupted the status quo by moving power out of Washington and back to the American people. Ronald Reagan would have liked this kind of disruption. I've also heard it said that much of the work he has done in the last 15 years, including his newest book, can be considered addendums to that contract. Many of you may already have a copy, but Newt's newest book is entitled Breakout, Pioneers of the Future, Prison Guards of the Past, and the Epic Battle That Will Decide America's Fate. Personally, I've always thought of Newt Gingrich as an historian, a teacher, and certainly a forward thinker. And tonight, he's going to teach us what the title of his book really means and enlighten us as to how we can contribute to our future. I'm also hoping he'll give us a little of his own insight into the upcoming elections, both in terms of congressional seats as well as maybe the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you to all of you for that uh, warm welcome. I'm delighted, both Calista and I are delighted to be back here. Uh, 
in many ways, I think it's particularly appropriate to bring uh, her newest book, uh, From Sea to Shining Sea, in which Ellis the Elephant goes uh, on the Lewis and Clark expedition as a way of introducing four to eight-year-olds to American history. Because in uh, President Reagan's farewell address, he warned about the degree to which we were no longer teaching history and how important it was for us to learn about America. And in that sense, I think that uh, her Ellis the Elephant series is precisely in the tradition the president would have approved of if aimed at a slightly younger group than he might have been talking to in his farewell address. I'm also delighted to be here to talk about the future, but I want to take a minute because I know you today, slightly out of sequence, but today you are celebrating the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I think that there's a very interesting case study in leadership in the Reagan speech in 1987 and a remarkable contrast. I know a lot of people worry about where America's at and the mess we're in and the lack of leadership in Washington. And you know, this all reminds me a great deal of Jimmy Carter. Um, <laughs> and I think one of the, it's, it, 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 it's an illustration of why 2016 will be important and why every election can be important because people could easily have said in 1979, 1980, uh, and in fact, Theodore White in his book, The Making of the President in 1980, did say that the wheels were coming apart. You had massive inflation, you had unemployment, you had high interest rates, you had the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan, you had this, the, the communists in uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador uh, working their way in, in, in Grenada. Um, and there was a feeling that, that you know, a, a French author wrote a book on the death of democracy. I mean, there was this whole sense of real problems. Uh, President Carter, you remember, uh, talked about uh, that, that we were faced with malaise and, and President candidate Reagan, then Governor Reagan said, actually, we weren't faced with malaise. We were faced with an incompetent president. Uh, and the American people thought, let me get this straight. Keep Jimmy and have malaise. Get rid of Jimmy and get rid of malaise. You know, and uh, Reagan won a surprisingly big victory in 1980. Uh, because people came to a summary judgment that, in fact, they, didn't, they weren't comfortable with where we were going and it was time for a change. So in that context, to go to the Berlin Wall, a piece of which is standing right out here, Reagan first commented on the wall coming down in 1967. As governor of California, he went to Berlin and he had a throwaway line. He said, that wall sure is ugly. They ought to tear it down. Um, 20 years later, having lost the presidential nomination in 1968, something he personally almost never referred to uh, because he didn't run very long and he didn't run very well and it irritated him. Uh, and then having lost the nomination to Jerry Ford in 76, Reagan came back, won the nomination in 80, won the presidency, and then in 84 carried 49 states. And I think if he'd wanted to, uh, would have carried Minnesota, deliberately did not campaign in Minnesota the last weekend because he didn't want to humiliate uh, Mondale. Uh, Reagan was not greedy and thought 49 states sort of sent the message. Uh, <clears throat> and I was very struck recently, I, I watched, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but if you go on YouTube, you can pull up the, the, the Bear commercial uh, that they ran in uh, 1984, and that, that there's a bear in the woods and you know the bear is dangerous and so forth. And it occurred to me recently that we actually could now do sort of an entire collection of bears. I mean, because you now have Putin and you have the problems in Ukraine and Crimea, you have ISIS, uh, you have uh, problems, all sorts of different, you have Ebola, so that uh, we've gone from a single bear to lots of other bears, uh, but the world is dangerous and you need strong leadership. So Reagan had, had won re-election and was gonna go back to Berlin. And in the draft of the speech, that he was gonna give in Berlin, he says, uh, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And uh, I'm curious, because many of you are, are Reagan uh, students and know a lot about Reagan. How many of you know what comes next? Just raise your hand if you know this story, because I'm just curious. Okay, so like, most of you don't, so good. I, can, I was gonna tell it anyway, but I'm just curious how many of you. Uh, so Reagan, it gets sent over to the State Department, which, which was not particularly, positive in the Reagan era and has gotten dramatically worse since then. And the editors at the State Department take it out. And they say, look, it's, it's, it's not a good thing to do. It's going to offend Mr. Gorbachev. You really shouldn't say this. So it goes back to the White House and Reagan writes it in in hand. 
and sends it back to the State Department, where the State Department editors take it out a second time and send it back to the White House. At which point, Secretary Schultz told me he gets this phone call, and it's the president. And he says, Georgie, you need to tell your staff that I'm the president. They aren't. <laughs> it's staying in. So they get to Berlin. And the morning before the speech, all of his senior advisors are begging him to take the line out. And their argument is that it was totally unrealistic and the wall was going to be there another 20 or 30 years and he was going to look foolish. And he listened to all of them at breakfast and he said, I'm keeping the line in. Now, it, it's, it's a fascinating study in effective leadership. Reagan believed that winning moral dominance was important. Napoleon had said that, that the moral is to the physical as three is to one. That is, it's three times as important as physical in warfare. And Reagan believed this. And he understood that here was an opportunity to really put pressure directly on Gorbachev and to keep Gorbachev on defense. And so he delivered the line. We, we've done a movie about Ronald Reagan, and Cliff and I are very proud of, and, and uh, Rendezvous with Destiny. And when you see him deliver the line, you know, I mean, they're, they're, not since Franklin Roosevelt have we had a president who could have delivered a line this well. Uh, and of course, the wall came down two years later. And I remember the night the wall came down, um, they had a reporter sitting down with Reagan, uh, Sam Donaldson. Uh, they were at the ranch by this time. The president had, had retired. And Donaldson said, were you surprised? And he said, well, and I, think, I think the simplicity and the clarity of the following is part of what made Reagan such an extraordinary historic leader. He said, well, you know, Sam, I always figured there were Germans on both sides of the wall. I just want you to think about that for a second, okay? <laughs> so after all this fancy, complex CIA, State Department analysis, Reagan had cut through to the core fact, which is the Germans in East Germany would rather be with the Germans in West Germany than be with the Russians. And that's what happened. And it was the end. But, but it took a leader who understood the importance of communicating a moral case in a vivid and powerful way. And when you get that kind of a leader, it's amazing what you can achieve, and it's amazing how far you can move things. So I want to very briefly, so we have time for, for talking about these things, and at the, at the end I'll talk briefly about the elections, because you specifically asked me to, and uh, in coming here, you're my boss for the evening, so I feel compelled. So, but before I do that, I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about the extraordinary opportunity we have to take the, the Goldwater and Reagan vision of a more limited government and develop it in a way which uses modern technology to just dramatically change things, which is what Breakout is all about. And I tell younger audiences that they are going to be the most creative audience, in, or the most creative generation in rethinking government since the Founding Fathers. And I believe it is absolutely unavoidable, and I'm going to talk about that. Then I'm going to talk about the two epidemics that we're faced with. Uh, radical Islamism, of which ISIS is the most current form, and Ebola. So I'm going to take those three on, and then we're going to talk briefly about the election, and then we'll take questions. And I am thrilled, and close to thrilled, to be once again back here. And of course, we're always glad, delighted to be at the Gallagher's. And we have worked together and did a lot of things together. Uh, and frankly, had his advice been taken early on on uh, immigration and other problems, we would be a healthier, more stable, and more law-abiding country today. So you were a pioneer, and I wish the country had listened to you more carefully. Now, in that context, let me talk first about breakout. And it's a very simple model. We are right at the point where the bureaucratic systems which came out of the manual typewriter are going to be so obsolete because of modern technology like the iPad and the smartphone, that it will be indefensible to prop up the old bureaucracies. And much of what we complain about in Washington, the failure of the IRS, 
um, the failure of Obamacare and the Obama websites, uh, the failure of, of the Center for Disease Control with, with um, what's happening with Ebola. Many of these things are not about this president, but they're in fact systemic collapses of bureaucracies that are incapable of moving at the speed of the modern world, much of which we saw initially foreshadowed in the FEMA failure in New Orleans after Katrina. And so this is a, this is a deep long-term historic pattern. And I wanna use a couple of simple examples. If you, if you think about the notion that modern bureaucracy in many ways is about contemporary with the development of the manual typewriter and is a rule-based bureaucratically centered system so that the high water mark of that kind of bureaucracy was the 1943 opening of a building which has 17 and a half miles of corridor and has 31,000 people in it because that's what it took to run a world war with uh, manual typewriters and carbon paper. And I tell every conservative group, one of our goals should be to take the Pentagon and turn it into a triangle because you surely should be able to eliminate 40% of the bureaucrats who were required by carbon paper and manual typewriters. And it's this scale we're talking about. Now let me put it in context for all of you. How many of you have gotten money out of automatic teller machines outside the United States? Raise your hand if you got money out of an ATM, okay? So almost half of you. So this is not a theory, right? This is a fact. You walk up to an anonymous machine in a foreign country. You put in a plastic card. The screen lights up. It has six or eight languages. You pick one of the ones you're good at. <laughs> you punch in a four number code. It reaches out 7,500 miles across six international boundaries. It finds your bank, validates that you have an account, verifies you have enough money, and it gives you the local currency and the amount you ask for and the whole thing takes about 11 seconds. Does that sound about right? Now, three of those seconds are on the internet, eight seconds are you typing. <laughs> now, that's literally, so three, three seconds is the internet exchange worldwide. And it's stunningly accurate. Now, let me give you, and by the way, you don't actually know the exchange rate of the machine, but you assume that it's better than your hotel. Now, let me give you a comparison. 11 seconds worldwide versus 277 days to move information from the Defense Department to the Veterans Administration. Uh, stunning accuracy worldwide in every, in every uh, currency versus the Internal Revenue Service last year sent out $4 billion in refunds to people who should not have gotten them. My favorite is a house in Shanghai, which got 353 checks. Um, now imagine, I mean, you're, you're a bureaucracy, you send one false refund to Shanghai, it's a mistake. You send two false refunds, it's an embarrassment. You send three false refunds, it's an outrage. How do you describe a bureaucracy that can send 353 refunds and not notice it. Uh, it's actually not the record. The record last year was a house in Lithuania that got 450 checks. And you can imagine the happiness. <laughs> Uncle Sam loves me, you know. But here, this is the gap between the manual typewriter world that we still have dominating all of our, from, from city council, county commission, school board, state government, federal government, all of them still operate in the mindset of these kind of paper-based and carbon paper-based models. Now, let me go to the, the, the second area. Uh, how many of you have a smartphone? Okay. Um, how many of you have an old-fashioned cell phone? Handful. Is there anybody here who doesn't have either? <laughs> no, you, you okay, there's one over there. I mean, there's one here. I mean, occasionally you find people like that. They're, you know, uh, you wonder if they walked to the event uh, or what other absence of modernity occurs in their life, but still. 
Uh, so, but most of you have a smartphone already. About 74% of the country <clears throat> has a smartphone. And it's it presently will be virtually 100%. How many of you, let me give you, this is, uh, this is an iPhone 5. Uh, the iPhone 6, which just came out, is 84 times, that's 8,400%, the computing power of the original iPhone. And this particular version is about a 2003 laptop in computing power. But that actually doesn't explain it because what this really is is an entrance to all of the information of the entire planet. And so we, we actually have no language yet to describe the capabilities of, this, of the system that we hold in our hand. Example, how many of you uh, have GPS on your smartphone? Okay, virtually all of you. How many of you use it to find places you've never been to before? Okay, virtually all. How many of you no longer carry a map in your car? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, think about this. All of this is very recent. As recently as 1987, I was at Fort Irwin getting lost uh, because uh, land navigation used to be very, very difficult in the Army. Uh, as recently as 1990, I was at Desert Shield uh, flying around in, in Blackhawks with pilots who had bought the GPS from Sears with their own money because the Army had not yet fit GPS into the Blackhawks. It's 1990. Now, every teenager has GPS. Doesn't mean they're not lost, but at least, <laughs> but, but they, they have the potential. Now, what people don't realize yet is that the, that the potential power of this to transfer power away from bureaucracy to the individual is, is stunning. There are over 93,000 medical applications. Um, at Gingrich Productions, we do one podcast and two newsletters a week that are free. So if you go to GingrichProductions.com, you can sign up and get them. And in August, I gave a speech at the, at the American Enterprise Institute, which, which we've posted, and which AEI also has posted, in which I outlined the contrast between trying to fix the VA bureaucracy versus inventing a brand new 21st century smartphone-empowered veteran support system. They're totally different models. Over here, you're trying to get the Los Angeles VA to not delete 3,000 names in order to have a shorter waiting list. Over here, you have a veteran who files for their own application, so they have on their smartphone that they have filed to see a doctor, and you can't delete it, because they have it. Over here, you occasionally go to the VA to see a doctor or see a nurse to have your vital signs taken. Over here, you have a smartphone which takes your vital signs 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you wanted to. Uh, Dr. Michael Burgess, who's a congressman from Dallas, who some of you may have seen in the recent Ebola hearings, a very smart guy, has an EKG device on his smartphone. So he can literally take an EKG, send it to his cardiologist, and look at it himself. Cost about $100. Uh, he also has an app that, that looks at his uh, oxygen content. Uh, he has an app that looks at his blood sugar. All this is without being invasive. And so you're starting to move towards a world where you could have a veteran come in one time, get a thorough workup of what their health concerns were, and knit them together a smartphone that had the apps they needed so that they were monitoring their own health 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the information was being automatically sent to their doctor. So that the doctor you know, could call you one week and say, you don't need to come in, you're doing great. They could call you another week and say, please sit down, the ambulance will be there in 12 minutes. <laughs> but it's a totally different way of thinking about putting this together. We're working with a group of veterans in Southern California who are putting together a smartphone app so that if you have PTS and you're feeling depressed and you're in danger of suicide, you actually could go online, put in your zip code, and find local veterans who are prepared to talk with you and be your friend and be a support group and try to help you work through it so that you have a veteran-to-veteran -veteran relationship at no cost. I mean, these things are extraordinary changes. And so I think what you're going to see is a genuine breakout from the models we've inherited from the past to empowering citizens at every level with every kind of capability and doing so in a way which makes life 
dramatically more exciting, increases our ability to learn, increases our ability to get things done, reduces the cost of government dramatically. I would argue, for example, and, and I've worked at national defense issues for a very long time, I would argue that if you reduce the Pentagon to a triangle, you will get better national defense with faster evolution to modern technology at lower cost. So it's not a question of more or less. It's a question of better or worse. I don't think you can fix the VA bureaucracy. I think it's impossible. And I think you've got to be thinking about what's the replacement model. I don't think you can fix the IRS bureaucracy. And so I think that we're right at the edge of a period where you're going to see very bold and very dramatic proposals for change. Uh, and they're going to lead to a country which is healthier, more productive, dramatically more powerful economically, uh, creates an entire new generation of jobs, uh, and enables us to rethink from the ground up how to help the very poor and how to extend knowledge and capability so that virtually every child in America genuinely has the right to pursue happiness. I'm very excited by it. And the book gives you a flavor of this scale. And as I said, if you want to keep up with what we're doing, we do two newsletters and a podcast every week that you can get at GingrichProductions.com for free. And we'd be delighted to to share that information with you. So that's, that's the optimistic side. And I, am, I am strategically very optimistic. I believe we're about to break out and we're about to have just very dramatically better future than anybody currently expects on an even bigger scale than the shift from Carter to Reagan. Uh, because I think the underlying momentum of technology and of opportunity is going to be so much deeper than it was in the 1980s. And I think that's going to happen almost uh, despite Washington and despite our elites and despite the degree to which they want to avoid it. Now, I think there are two clouds on the near horizon. Now, one of them is uh, ISIS and radical Islamism, and the other is Ebola. And I think, ironically, they're actually very similar. They're both essentially uh, viral epidemics. Uh, and I think the, one of the major reasons we have not been able to come to grips with the challenge of radical Islamism is that no one in our elite is willing to look seriously at the nature of our enemies. Now, this is not about Syria. This is not about Iraq. This is not about Afghanistan. This is about a worldwide movement of people who are genuinely deeply committed because of religious belief uh, and who are very dedicated to destroying our civilization and in the process, if necessary, destroying us. And it is spreading by internet and it is spreading by, by people who go around uh, advocating and recruiting uh, so that I would argue, and he apparently yesterday had uh, a, a, an Islamic radical uh, hit two Canadian soldiers and kill one of them with a car. Uh, and what is clearly, the Canadians are not infected with the uh, political correctness of the Obama administration. And so they've indicated that when somebody who was a radical Islamist deliberately sought out two soldiers to hit them with a the car, they regarded that as a terrorist act. As you'll remember, when the army major jumped up, yelled Allahu Akbar, had a card in his wallet that said soldier of Allah, and had been communicating to a radical cleric in Yemen, uh, the US Army promptly labeled it a workplace incident, which was just so intellectually dishonest and blocks you from trying to solve the problem. So when you have somebody in Oklahoma City who beheads a coworker, and you find out that they have been going on websites that show beheadings, and you find out that they are a convert to Islam, uh, to describe that as a workplace incident is a willful avoidance of reality. And so I think this is a great problem. The, the State Department, which is a major center of disinformation and confusion and profound dishonesty about the nature of the world, um, is, is a, a good example of this. For, until, until 2013, they refused to recognize that Boko Haram was a terrorist organization of international proportions. And their argument was that Boko Haram, this is the group in north, northwest, uh, or northeast uh, Nigeria who kidnapped the 200 girls, uh, which was a problem that was so important we actually created a Twitter ha hashtag for it and then forgot about it. Um, their argument is that they're a local group. Well, anybody who studied Boko Haram knew that when they were very first organized in 2001, the base camp they created in northeastern Nigeria was called Afghanistan. Now, for a local group, why are they calling it Afghanistan? Well, they're calling it Afghanistan in direct tribute to the Taliban. 
And it turns out they go to international terrorist conferences. Now, I know this sounds slightly strange, but these guys get together. They meet in Yemen or they meet in Somalia or they, get, they meet in parts of Saudi Arabia. Um, sometimes they go to Afghanistan or Northwest Pakistan. And you know, they have conferences and they have, you know, they have workshops. I mean, you know, how have your terrorist activities been going? Let me tell you my problems with my terrorist activities. You know, we haven't been able to get very much attention. Well, have you tried beheading people on video? You know, I mean, well, they sit around and brainstorm. I mean, how could we do a better job of being a terrorist? Um, our system doesn't cover any of this. And we don't pay attention to it. We don't look at the fact that ISIS, which is actually a pretty intelligently run operation, um, very decentralized, because they study us. And one of the things they figured out is, if you talk on a cell phone, we find you. So they now delegate power to their local leaders and they say, don't call us. Do what you think will work and keep moving. Uh, if we need to change things, we'll send a messenger. But they don't, they don't talk on, on the air anymore because they figured out if you talk on the air, we'll find you. And so they're actually getting much smarter than they were two or three or four years ago. But we don't take any of this into account. And they're basically following the strategy that Muhammad followed uh, in the seventh century. They, they, they go into an area, they're doing this in Lebanon right now. They go in first and they assassinate people. So you're not on my side, fine, you're going to die. Uh, then when the other folks are, so, when you watch a few people get assassinated, there's a tendency to say, well, you know, I, you guys are okay. You know, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to you. Then the next thing they do is they start raiding in order to disrupt the local system. And so they'll, they'll hit a place, tear it apart, and leave, not trying to conquer it at that point, just trying to break it up. And then when they finally conquer it, they start establishing social networks where they, one of the things they're doing right now is they're looting antiquities and selling them on the world market to get the money to then, to then provide food and medicine for, for people locally. So all of a sudden, for the average person, they become the folks who are taking care of you. Now, none of this is new. I mean, this is a, over a thousand year old model. Yet, to the best of my knowledge, none of our military schools teach it because it would be politically so incorrect. I mean, how could you actually presume that a group that studies the Koran, studies Muhammad, immerses itself in the history of that time, would actually be using the techniques that were used? Well, you can't do that because that would be to suggest that they were somehow related to Islam. And they can't be related to Islam because that would be wrong. So even if they call themselves Islamic, they're not really Islamic, which is why you have the president say, in a, you know, the opposite of Reagan. I mean, Reagan understood from 1947 or so on, the communists were actually communist. He ran into somebody in, in the Screen Actors Guild uh, who basically said, look, I really am a Stalinist. I really hope we take over. If we take over, you're gonna go to jail or get shot. And Reagan took it seriously. He said, you know, this guy's a sincerely dedicated communist. And he became very intensely anti-communist. Well, what you've had with, with elites like President Obama is the opposite. You can't really be who you say you are because that would violate my belief about your world. So watch, watch the frequency which the president explains they're really not Islamic. Well, how would he know? I mean, how, how can he go and say to a group who builds their whole system around Islam, you're not Islamic? And it's because the, the fear of our elites of having to deal with this problem head on is so deep that they will do almost anything. And this is dangerous because it means year by year it's gotten worse. There, there are, right to, the estimate last week was that there are 15,000 foreign fighters with ISIS from 80 countries. Now if you think about that for a minute, that means if you had a map of the world and you simply colored all the countries from which people are coming to, to be part of ISIS. You'd, have, you'd actually have well over half the world because they come, they come from Russia and the United States and Canada and Great Britain, et cetera. So the, 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 the area you would cover would be amazing. Yet how can you describe this as a local problem? And we end up worrying about one town on the Turkish border. Why? Because it's less frightening. Now. Ebola is, is, is the same pattern. If ISIS is an epidemic and needs to be dealt with as an epidemiology problem, this is a virus you have to eliminate. Ebola is obviously an epidemic, uh, and you're not even, you don't even have to stretch the parallel. I want to say up front, 
I am not any better prepared in medical terms than the president's Ebola czar. <laughs> so I want to concede that. However, I may have one advantage in analyzing Ebola as a threat, and that is I'm a historian. And if you look at the flu, the flu epidemic at the end of World War I, if you look at the Black Death in the Middle Ages, which killed about a third of Europe, if you look at the impact of various viruses that the, that the Europeans brought to the Western Hemisphere and the degree to which they wiped out Native Americans, or the impact, for example, that they had on the Aztecs, uh, what it leads you to believe is that viruses can be really, really dangerous. So I would argue if your choice is to underreact and hope it all works out, or to overreact and find out later on it wasn't that big a deal, you are historically always safer to overreact. So when people say, for example, well, you know, why would you stop people from leaving West Africa? Uh, and, and, and most public health people will tell you this, that they don't think that's effective or practical. My, my reaction is that fundamentally misleads you about the nature of public behavior. If this is not a big enough problem to stop issuing visas, it's not a big enough problem to mobilize the world to stop it. But on the other hand, if the potential threat is big enough, why wouldn't you stop issuing visas? I mean, why would you allow some guy to go to Dallas to see a personal friend carrying Ebola? and then spend about a half million dollars trying to save his life. And when you do that, what's the signal you send to everybody else who gets Ebola? You know, so when they say, well, we're gonna have them fill out a form. I mean, do you realize the level of total naivete it takes to suggest that somebody who thinks they might have been infected is gonna say voluntarily, oh, I guess I won't come to America till we see whether or not I die, versus oh, no, no, I've not been anywhere near Ebola and I don't know anything about it and I feel terrific uh, and, and whatever minor uh, you know, fever I might have, don't worry about it. You know, I've been out playing baseball. I mean, we have, again, an elite which designs rules as though people will obey them and then is shocked over and over again when people don't obey them. And human nature is to do, I think, in many cases, what they think is best for themselves. So I'm, I am adamantly in favor of ending any visas from countries that have a significant Ebola population until the, the virus is defeated. And I am in favor of dramatically overhauling the Food and Drug Administration and substantially overhauling the National Institutes of Health and the Center for Disease Control because I think their current rate of response is totally inadequate to the threat that is now growing. And I, and I do think there's a very real danger that Ebola is gonna become a pandemic. I, I, don't, I don't think it's the most likely future. I think the most likely future is that sometime next year, uh, after a substantial number of people have died, most of them, in, but not all of them in West Africa, we will get this under control. But I, do, I think it is possible. And I think for us to, to risk the lives of millions and millions of people, if, if we overreact, and it disappears. We'll look a little foolish, we'll have wasted some money, and we'll have taken some tough measures we probably didn't need to. But if we underreact, and this gets into three or four big cities, in places that don't have good public health, we're gonna have a nightmare. And that's why I would have a crash program to develop vaccines and get them through the FDA immediately. I would develop a crash program on how you treat Ebola and, and get that through the FDA immediately. And I would overhaul the priorities of the National Institutes of Health and the Center for Disease Control because you will find that there are lots of stuff they do that's not very relevant, but they use a lot of money, much of it for political reasons. Uh, and that it's not that we don't have enough money in these institutions. It's that they're not managed very well. And I would move towards a much more high tempo uh, system that's much more entrepreneurial and much more aggressive than our current bureaucracies. So I've given you a sweeping overview, um, which I think is totally appropriate at the uh, Reagan Library because he created sweeping changes. 
um, probably the most successful president in terms of his own definition of what he was trying to accomplish in modern times. He basically said, you know, I, I want to go to Washington. I want to defeat the Soviet empire. I want to rebuild American civic culture so people are proud to be American again. And I want to relaunch the American economy so people can create jobs and create wealth and pursue happiness. And it's fair to say at the end of eight years, if you, if you read, and we have part of it in our movie, if you read his farewell address, it's fair to say that he accomplished all three of those gigantic historic goals. Uh, and it is, it's one of the really remarkable presidencies and well worth studying. But anybody who thinks that we can't govern America should, should study Ronald Reagan and they will come away thinking the right people can easily lead the American people. And the American people, will, when led, will coerce the rest of the politicians into doing the right thing despite themselves. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, on the election, really briefly, I, I realized I had not met. I, I will, I'm going to give you my synopsis, and then we can go into it in detail during the questions, which will start in just a minute. Uh, the Republicans will win control of the Senate, probably between 52 and 55 seats. They will gain somewhere between 6 and 14 or more seats in the House and probably be at the all-time high for modern history in House seats. They'll probably break even or slightly more than break even in governor's races, uh, losing some, winning some. They will gain uh, well over 100 seats in, in the state legislature, maybe much more than that, and probably be at a high water mark as a party uh, since probably 1925 or so. I mean, maybe going back to 1920, which was an enormous one-sided Republican uh, landslide. So uh, it, in the end, just as without Jimmy Carter, you would not have gotten Ronald Reagan, and I've always felt a certain soft spot for Jimmy Carter because of that. Um, I think it's fair to say that without Barack Obama, you would not have the current tidal wave. And I must say, the last few days, he has gone out of his way to ensure that everybody understands that if you have a D after your name, you're an Obama Democrat. And I, I, I cannot, for the life of me, I cannot imagine what's going through his head uh, when he goes out and says these things, because they are just, in every single close race, they are toxic. They just, you know, here's this poor Democrat desperately saying, I'm not for Obama, I'm not for Obama, I'm not for Obama. And Obama comes along and says, oh, of course he is. <laughs> and I, I can, I really, I cannot figure out, I mean, of all the things he's done that have mystified me, this may be the weirdest, and I have no idea why he's doing it. But as a Republican, I am grateful beyond any imagination for the way he's done it. So should we take questions? The speaker has agreed to take questions, and in uh, honor of the speaker's politics, we're going to start here on the right. <laughs> wait, but I need you to wait for a, a microphone because we are live streaming this evening. So if you, if we have a microphone right here. Mr. Speaker, how, in your opinion, would you protect the United States from ISIS, particularly within our borders, from the terrorist cells that are probably brewing as I speak. Sure. Well, I think, I think you have to have uh, three immediate steps. First is you have to identify accurately what your enemy is. And you have to say it publicly and you have to let me, you have to have a national debate about it, just as we did about communism in the late 1940s. Uh, second, uh, you have to be prepared to control the border and, and to be serious about it and to mean it. Uh, and the combination of ISIS and Ebola should, should teach us this if nothing has. Uh, and, and, and you can control the border. Many countries do control the border. It is, it is an act of political de uh, decision not to. It's not an act of technical problem. Uh, and then third, you, you're probably going to have to pass a series of laws. It, 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 we will presently decide that it is perfectly fine to be Muslim within a framework of the modern world and that we are not in any way an anti-Muslim country. But we are an anti-Sharia country because Sharia law is fundamentally opposed to almost all of our values. We are an anti-radical Islamic country. Uh, we will probably make it illegal to give money to any of these groups. We'll make it illegal to recruit for these groups. We'll make it illegal to leave to go fight in these groups. Uh, we should define serving with ISIS as an act of treason because it puts you at war with your own country. I mean, when, when you're dealing with opponents, and I say this as a historian, again, from the New York Times standpoint, this makes me a very right wing, but I would argue in the Churchillian tradition, it actually just means that I understand history and they don't. 
when, when radical groups say to you, I want to destroy you, it is generally historically useful to believe them. <laughs> you know, so, so when, when, when people, I'll give you a very simple example. When people from the leadership of Hamas says, not a single Jew will remain. Well, you don't have to go back and look at the Holocaust and study Adolf Hitler to figure out that what they mean is not a single Jew will remain. And so one of the things I'm going to try to get done is to get a bill introduced in the House and Senate that says no U.S. money will ever again go to any organization in either Gaza or the West Bank that refuses to recognize Israel's right to exist. Why would we fund? Yeah. It's very straightforward. Okay. I think we had one right here. Thank you. Just two observations. In the mid-1990s, Congress actually the, uh, required that the U.S. banking system make loans to people that had, had no money, no credit, no job, and thus created the housing crisis that we experience even to this day and caused a worldwide recession. That was to apparently help those with the subprime loans. Conversely, uh, in another avenue, healthcare, before the insurance companies were all nonprofit, mid 90s they all became for profit, and thus the premium escalation took off at that point. All this by Congress trying to make our lives better. And they have really mucked it up. At what point is Congress going to step away and let us take care of our business and stop trying to make our life better? <laughs> The challenge you have is that the next Congress will try to find new ways to make your life better by undoing the old ways in which they made your life better because they will conclude the old ways were a failure but the new ways will be terrific. God about says it all. I think we have one back there. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, my question is regarding the Republican Party actually. I'm a big fan of the Republicans. I'm a lifelong Republican, I'm only, only 50. But um, I'm really frustrated by the lack of fight in the last two presidential elections. I feel like McCain missed several opportunities to hit Obama with low-hanging fruit. I don't think Romney did a much better job. In fact, I think Dinesh D'Souza has done a better job of exposing this president <laughs> than the Republicans. And so I don't understand where, where the fight has gone. And it goes down to things like the IRS. How come the Republicans are so ineffectual, you know, coming against the weaponization of the IRS against our people? And well, where's the fight? Well, I mean, let me say, first of all, as a party which closed the federal government last year, and in one of those unusual historic moments, uh, lost popular support very dramatically over the period of the government shutdown. And then, and this is truly, when you look back, this is why I'm a historian. I'm not a social scientist because I don't think anything actually occurs. In, anytime you see a curve or a line like this, you know it's not how the world works. Uh, I mean, imagine if, if the Obamacare website had collapsed first and then the Republicans had closed the government. We'd be in a totally different environment. The fact was the Republicans had lost dramatic popular support in a two or three week period over closing the government. And then the week after they reopened the government, the Obamacare website crashed in a vivid demonstration of government incompetence. Uh, and by the time they got done looking at the, the Obamacare website, people had forgotten about the Republicans having closed the government. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's because Republicans didn't fight. I mean, clearly they fought there. I mean, you had Ted Cruz and you had the, the Tea Party wing in the House impose a very aggressive confrontational strategy uh, that candidly didn't work. Uh, and, and so I think part of it is you've got to figure out what works and what doesn't work and what, what are you capable of doing. Um, the, uh, I think what you're going to see is the Republicans, if they win control, are going to roll back a number of things. And I would say, for example, here in California, Daryl Issa has done a tremendous job taking on uh, the IRS, among others, and, and digging into them and forcing things out in the open and, and uh, working on it. But I think as long as you have Harry Burr, uh, I'm sorry, as long as you have Harry, Harry Reid in charge of the uh, Senate, you are not 
going to get anything done because Reed's primary goal in life is to protect uh, Obama and the left. So this is one of the reasons why these Senate elections, I think, are, are so extraordinarily important. You, you end up with McConnell and Bain, Boehner as, as a team. Uh, and I think you're going to see a very, very different uh, Congress in January. I think, in terms, I think one of the great problems Republicans have, and this is one of the reasons I love coming to the Reagan Library, that this is something that, that Nixon talked about in, in, in the 40s and 50s, and, and after Nixon retired, I went to see him uh, several times when I was a junior congressman trying to understand what to do. And, and he, said, uh, he said two things that were very profound that, that, that affected what we did. He said, first of all, the House Republicans were very boring. Uh, he said, when I was there, when I was elected in 1946, they were really boring. And they're still really boring. And he said, if you're going to get any attention, you can't be boring. Uh, and he said, go back there and get a bunch of guys together uh, and, and meet every week and figure out how to be not boring. And, and the Conservative Opportunity Society, in many ways, came out of that conversation. He also said, until you penetrate the elite media to a point where you're on the cover of Time and Newsweek, people will never pay enough attention to the House to elect a Republican Congress. And for whatever it's worth, two weeks before we won in 1994, we were on the cover of Time and Newsweek. So, so it, it took a real effort that was very unique in the 40-year period of being in the minority. Now, the reason I tell you this story is this. Reagan was an FDR Democrat. Reagan was also a movie actor who had a job on radio and who was in television. So Reagan got up every morning and he understood communications, which made him a non-Republican. Even when he switched and became a Republican, he was a non-Republican. That's why, and that's why the entire establishment was for Ford in 76, because Reagan was this outsider. The Republican establishment is made up of hugely moneyed people who prefer boredom to victory. And they like to nominate people who are totally inarticulate. <laughs> and, and it makes them feel good about themselves because they're their kind of guy. They can sit around the table on Sunday and be equally inarticulate. Uh, this is a business where if you can't lead, and there's a wonderful book called The Education of Ronald Reagan about his years at General Electric that I recommend to everybody as a study in civic leadership. If you can't communicate effectively, which means it has to be in the mind of the listener, not the speaker. If you don't have a message of power and a message of clarity and a message that more moves people morally and emotionally, you can't run a free society. And there's a huge block of the Republican Party and most of its consulting class that believe the job of the candidate is to raise the money to give to the consultant to buy the attack ads so the candidate can go out and raise more money so when they get elected they can spend their entire time raising the money to give to the consultant to buy the attack ads. And I am totally opposed to a negative campaign attack ad based model of governance because it gives you no ability to organize the country and it polarizes people in hostile ways and makes it much more difficult for America to solve its problems. And I would, ch I would challenge you to look at the Reagan campaigns, which were idea oriented, which had a, a positive visionary sense of America and which in many ways were romantic and compare them to the junk that we get from most of our consulting class today, and it is really a decay of the process of self-government. Okay, we have time for one more question. Who has the best question? We have time for one more question. Right here. Wait for the microphone. I want to know what we'll, uh, hello, my name is Jordan, and I would like to know what we can do about getting universal health care for everybody like places like Canada, Sweden, and the list goes on and on, and we're one of the only countries, the only country that doesn't have universal health care, and why, you know, that's it. Well, I think, I think Americans have uh, always resisted government-run health care, which is what universal health care becomes, because it inevitably, in the long run, uh, decays. I mean, if you look at, for example, breast cancer outcomes in Great Britain, or you look at prostate cancer outcomes in Great Britain, uh, they, were, they would be totally unacceptable in the United States. Uh, I actually think we need to have a national debate about whether our, our interest is in guaranteeing that everybody has what you said, which is health care, or, or, or our interest is in guaranteeing that everybody have health insurance. We spent most of the last 40 years fighting over insurance, and that may have been wrong. 
My guess is that between free clinics, federal community health centers, and a variety of other means, you could actually provide guaranteed access to health care at a very low cost compared to the cost of providing guaranteed access to health insurance. And I think that's a national debate that we need. Can I say, can I say one last thing? I just want to take one second and thank everybody who donates to the library, participates in the library, everybody who's a docent here, everybody who works on the, the professional staff. Cliss and I have been out here many times. Uh, one of our, our most enjoyable presidential debates was out here, uh, both enjoyable because of the debate and <laughs> enjoyable because of just the environment and the surroundings and the wonderful way in which everybody uh, here treats us. This is a great national treasure. And many people will be educated and will come in contact with an important part of our history by being able to come here. And I am thrilled, Calista joins me in being thrilled, to once again uh, being able to be part of the extended Reagan family. And we thank you so much for hosting us.